Hi, everybody. All right, let's talk about sexual disorders and gender dysphoria. So the sexual disorders that we that are included in the DSM are delayed ejaculation, erectile disorder, female orgasmic disorder, female sexual interest and arousal disorder, genitopelvic pain, penetration disorder, male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and premature or otherwise early ejaculation. So this is, a, to me, a very important area of the DSM to really keep clinical distress and things like that into consideration. So because there is so much diversity in terms of sexuality, sexual behavior, um, some diversity in sexual functioning, it is important to also to keep that in mind, which I guess is covered in a, a secondary slide here. But also um, it's important to understand or to consider that sometimes people just really don't know enough about sex, sexuality, sexual behavior, and like what it takes in many cases to kind of achieve. And I don't, I don't love that word because <laughs> I don't think sex should be outcome oriented, um, but difficult to like get to or do what they would like to do. Um, so clinical judgment should be used to determine if the sexual difficulties are a result of inadequate sexual stimulation. So in many cases, we need to step in and um, educate. So there are there may still be a need for care, but a diagnosis of sexual dysfunction may not be made or wouldn't be made. So here we can step into a psychoed role, which is important. So if you're going to be working with the DSM in your practice and you are going to be diagnosing individuals with various uh, mental health diagnoses, you should know quite a bit about them. So it's not a, like, you shouldn't feel pressured with this. Of course, you'll have people to consult with. Um, but if you, in particular, personally don't have a whole lot of knowledge around sex or confidence around sex, not necessarily your personal um, sexual experience. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable talking about this stuff or educating about this stuff, I really encourage you to unpack some of that and to get educated. Um, so conditions in which a lack of knowledge about effective stimulation prevents the experience of arousal or orgasm, that is not uncommon. Um, so another thing I really wanted to point out, like these bottom two, these sec second and third bullet points here are really a lot of our bread and butter as couples therapists is recognizing that sex and sexuality, it's essentially under the umbrella of couples or marital or, you know, relationships. I know that not everybody is in a dyadic relationship. Um, that communication issues and difficulty asserting oneself and sharing one's needs and desires sexually with their partner can absolutely be a reason or a contributing factor to this. And the knee jerk or the first thought of the couple might be, oh, we need to, this is a, a disorder. This is a dysfunction um, that we need medicine or medical intervention. Um, when relationship issues and communication could really be um, a big driving force in this. So within um, the sexual dysfunctions, there are um, multiple subtypes and severity. So make sure that you, when you are doing your um, historical assessment that you are asking about, like how, how long has this been happening? So if you're going to specify with lifelong, that is when the sexual problem has been present since their first sexual experience. Acquired is when the sexual disorder develops over a period of relatively normal sexual functioning. Um, generalized is when sexual difficulties are not limited to certain types of stimulation, stimulation situations or partners. 
And then situational refers to dif difficulties that only occur with certain types of st stimulation situations or partners. Um, so make sure that you're asking questions about when does this come up? Um, one of the things that I've um, encountered in my own clinical work is a partner's inability to become aroused or to orgasm with their partner, but they're able to do that um, on their own with like manual stimulation or the use of pornography or something like that. So to me, that indicates some kind of issue going on with the partners. And then you'll also indicate severity. So you will, what each of these, as you saw, um, diagnoses have very, very similar um, criterion A. Uh, so here at mild would be um, the, what the criterion A are, there, there's mild distress over that, moderate is moderate distress over the criteria A, and severe is severe or extreme distress over criterion A. So this is a big differentiating factor. So there may be things where, you know, a, a patient, client, however, you know, whatever setting you're in could be talking to you about these issues. And if they do not have distress around it, it is not a problem. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, so here are the five factors that um, are listed in this section of diagnoses to really keep in mind. So again, many of these things could have contextual factors that you need to take into consideration when you are assessing. So what's going on with their partner or partners? What's, does their partner have any sort of sexual problems? What's their partner's health status? You know, is there any medical reason why something could be going on? Relationship factors, as I said, poor communication, discrepancies in desire for sexual activity. So remember, discrepancies in desire or discrepancies in like kind of functioning with their partner is does not constitute grounds for a diagnosis. Individual vulnerability factors. So how do they feel about their body? Do they have any history of sexual or emotional abuse? Might they have any comorbidities like depression or anxiety where there could be neurological explanations or medication explanations for what's going on? Any sort of stressors? You know, have they recently lost a job? Have they recently lost a person or animal or relationship um, that is really important to them? Taking into consideration cultural or religious factors. So are there any inhibitions related to prohibitions against sexual activity or pleasure? What are their cultural attitudes towards sexuality? This is a big one. I will say um, coming from the Bible Belt, you know, the last institution I was at was in Birmingham, Alabama. Lots and lots of, um, you know, silence around sexuality. Uh, a lot of very strong religious messages around what's appropriate. Um, you know, I taught in a graduate program and so I'm, you know, working with at least 22 year olds um, who like 22 to, you know, we had some non-traditional students in their fifties and that wasn't always really the case here, but, you know, I had lots of students within their twenties that had never um, talked about sex who, you know, didn't really know anything about orgasms or um, erections or labia or anything like that. So I taught the sexuality class in our program. So, um, you know, it was always very interesting for me to read some of their reflections and just really see where sex was talked about in a very problematic way. So many of them went to like religious, uh, middle schools and high schools, um, where some of the messaging from, so that many of them went to Catholic schools, um, where the messaging about their virginity, particularly to the women, um, was that like your virginity is, imagine a piece of like untouched uh, aluminum foil. <laughs> and they, what they did to teach them about like sex and the sin of sex is they had each, per they took this piece of tin foil and passed it around to each person in the room and had them like touch it and crumble it a little bit. And they were basically like, so this is your virginity. Once you let one person um, do that, or once you lose your virginity, 
like now we're going to try to flatten this thing back out. <laughs> so just like very weird messaging around. And like, again, the, the boys in the middle school did not get this same messaging. So again, very gendered, um, very patriarchal. <laughs> so, and, and these are messages that my students could very readily, um, you know, access in their mind. So, okay. As uh, as I said about sexual response has a requisite biological underpinning, yet is usually experienced in an intrapersonal, interpersonal, or cultural context. So this is why, particularly in this section, the DSM really uh, talks a lot about understanding the complex interaction between biological, sociocultural, and psychological factors. Then, as I mentioned earlier, please make sure that you take into account clinical distress, clinically significant distress. Um, you know, there are many women, for example, who um, do not orgasm during any sort of sexual activity, and it is just not a distressing thing. So you don't need to make something out of something that it's not. Okay, so let's get into them. Delayed ejaculation, the um, screening question here, does it take you too long? And again, this is subjective. That's why this language is here to reach a climax during sexual activity. So criterion A here is you are, you have either of the following symptoms that are experienced three fourths to all of the time in partnered sexual activities. Um, and without desiring, um, without that individual desiring delay. So the desire is there, but that person is experiencing marked delay in ejaculation or marked in frequency or absence of ejaculation. So this a criterion A needs to have a minimum duration of six months. You're going to see that that is very um, across the board with these uh, sexual dysfunctions. And then symptoms of criterion A cause clinically significant distress. Uh, and then you, another thing that you will see, so uh, B, C, and D in this category of diagnoses are all pretty similar, that this is not better explained by a non-sexual mental disorder. So again, it may be something uh, connected to depression or anxiety or the medications that are um, connected to that. So it's not attributable, attributable to the effects of either substance or medication, which as we know, you know, this is part of the differential diagnosis process. And as I said, the definition of delay does not have precise boundaries as there is non-consensus as to what constitutes a reasonable time to reach orgasm or what is unacceptably long for most men and their sexual partners. So again, this is subjective. You can use some clinical judgment here. So if the, the guy, for example, is, so it, there is a little bit of a benchmark here in like less than 60 seconds. Um, and as we know, po like pop culturally, that that's a joke for that, for this as well. Um, but if you have a man saying like, yeah, it only takes me 15 minutes. Um, that's my, might be where you step in and say like, that's actually a pretty normative amount of time. All right, erectile dysfunction screening question here is, do you often have problems maintaining an erection? So at least one of these three for criterion A happen three fourths to all of the time in occasions of sexual activity. So again, this is potentially in identified situational context. If it is generalized, it is in all contexts, but this person has difficulty in obtaining an erection during sexual activity. They have a difficulty maintaining an erection until the completion of sexual activity. Again, this is um, a completion as agreed upon with the participants within the sexual activity, marked decrease in erectile rigidity. So it might be um, it, their erection may not be as firm as they have had a history. And this is important too with aging. As we know, um, muscles de degenerate as you age. So a penis is a muscle. Um, and then same thing here with uh, criterion A that has been around for at least six months. So many men with erectile dysfunction have very low self-esteem, low self-confidence and a decreased sense of masculinity, which can create a depressed effect. And so if they are experiencing um, 
This may uh, contribute to fear or avoidance of sexual future sexual encounters. And this may also, you know, it's a bit of a cycle of, I don't feel good about myself. I'm not going to engage in this. I haven't engaged in this in a while. I'm having difficulty with this. Um, so decrease sexual satisfaction and reduce sexual desire can absolutely occur in the partner. So that is where you go back to those contextual factors of like, what is going on with the partner is a partner like shaming this individual? Are they making ultimatums with this person of like, if you don't get your shit together, we're going to get, we're going to break up. We're going to get divorced. I'm going to have an affair. I'm, you know, I'm going to cheat on you. I have people who can satisfy me. You can't. So that's where you really want to assess those interpersonal and relational um, dynamics as well. So some course modifiers here. So again, if you have somebody coming in talking about this, you may want to assess, um, you know, how, how has your erection, um, changed over time? If it has, do you smoke? Like, are you physically active? Have you been screened for or diagnosed with diabetes? Um, and then you also, particularly with sexual, uh, dysfunctions within the DSM, you are always screening for, unless it's explicitly in the diagnosis, you're always screening for de desire. Okay, female orgasmic disorder. Do you usually find it hard to achieve climax during sex? Again, this is probably one of the, um, you, you may have heard about like kind of the orgasm gap, particularly with women who identify as heterosexual and who are sexually partnered with um, individuals who identify as male. Um, that there is an orgasm, it's called the orgasm gap, um, where it's just really not distressing. So just please keep that in mind. So the, the uh, criterion A here is the presence of either of the following um, one or two in three fourths to all occasions of sexual activity. So a marked delay in, marked infrequency of, or absence of orgasm, marked re reduced intensity of orgasmic sensation. So again, this is probably going to comparison of other experiences, past experiences, and then these two need to be around for at least six months. So here I wanted to add the second piece and bold it because, um, again, you will be surprised if you are not already of the lack of understanding of sexuality, the lack of education around stimulation, um, you know, kind of regardless of where you come from. Uh, geographically within the United States. Uh, I know that there are many messages internationally around sex as well of abstinence. I uh, grew up in Northern Michigan, quite conservative little area up there. And I was given abstinence only sex education. Basically, they just showed us a lot of pictures of like STIs and were like, if you do this, this is basically what's going to happen to your genitals. Don't do it. Um, they did, sh I do remember them showing us or talking to the, uh, guys that were in middle school and saying that they had learned how to like put on a condom. But again, I, I just think, so they broke us up by, uh, gender. And, um, I just really think that in, in my experience and in the stories that many of my friends have shared or people, students have shared that they just really do a lot of like fear tactics with girls. Um, so anyway, I don't know what that's about. I mean, I do, it's the patriarchy, but you know, surprise, surprise. So um, only about 35% um, of women, and again, these are surveyed women, you know, I don't know if these are how accurate these numbers, but of the women who talked up to the surveyors, um, only about 35% of women can achieve orgasm um, through uh, the, uh, penetration. Um, so many women require a clitoral stimulation to reach orgasm and a relatively small proportion of women report that they always experience orgasm during uh, penile vaginal intercourse. So, so a woman experiencing orgasm through clitoral, so a woman's experiencing orgasm through clitoral stimulation, but not during intercourse does not meet criteria for a clinical diagnosis of female orgasmic disorder. It's also important to consider whether orgasmic difficulties are a result of inadequate sexual stimulation. In these cases, there are, there may still be a need for care, but a diagnosis of female orgasmic disorder would not be made. So again, you may need to educate your patient, client, couple about like what is desired, what is the, um, 
like what is adequate stimulation? So again, people just really don't know. So female interest, sexual interest or arousal disorder question here. Um, do you feel that your sexual desire is lower than it should be or that it is difficult for you to get sexually aroused? Um, so in criterion A, at least three of these six are present. So a lack of or significantly reduced sexual interest as manifested by at least three of the following, an absent or reduced interest in sexual activity, absence or reduced sexual erotic thoughts or fantasies, no or reduced initiation of sexual activity, and typically unreceptive to a partner's attempts to initiate an absence or reduce sexual excitement, pleasure during sexual activity, and almost all or all sexual encounters, an absence or reduced sexual interest or arousal in response to any internal or external sexual or erotic cues that, you know, such as reading, seeing, um, or yeah, or verbal or visual. Um, absence or reduced genital or non-genital sensations during sexual activity in all or almost all encounters. And then, as I said before, a sexual discrepancy in which a woman has lower desire for sexual activity than her partner is not sufficient to diagnose this. And then please um, assess this, the client's sexual history. As I said, what kind of messages have they received around sex, particularly, so you know, again, in potentially some of our experience that the messages around sex are different um, based on your gender. Um, and then experiences around different aspects of sexuality. This is also where you would want to screen for any sort of history of sexual assault um, or sexual abuse. So genital pelvic pain or penetration disorder, does vaginal intercourse usually hurt? So if the person is experiencing at least one of these following criterion A of vaginal penetration or pain, persistent or recurrent difficulties with vaginal penetration during sex, marked vulval vaginal or pelvic pain during vaginal intercourse or penetration attempts, um, marked fear or anxiety about vulval vaginal or pelvic pain in anticipation of during or as a result of vag vaginal penetration, then marked tensing or tightening of the pelvic floor muscles during attempted vaginal penetration. So um, just so all of you know, one of the treatments for this is, um, oh, I literally just had it in my head. Um, um, dilators, vaginal dilators that essentially start at the size of smaller than your pinky and go to a little bit larger than the average size of a, a penis. Um, so it's having to do with like some self-soothing, self-regulating, uh, relaxation techniques while um, using the dilators to put in the vaginal canal um, and then uh, relaxing while it's in there. So there, sometimes uh, we wonder like, what can we do with some of these uh, diagnoses? And this would be, um, this would be one of them. So for example, with, well, and then I'll talk about another potential um, couple or relational um, intervention with uh, premature ejaculation. So these are existing for at least six months and then the location of the pain as well as intensity should be assessed. Um, and then pain can be characterized as superficial or deep. The intensity of the pain is often not linearly related to distress or interference with sexual intercourse or other activities. And it would be encouraged that you are um, referring to a gynecological, having your client uh, engage in a gynecological exam and uh, perhaps that you would also have a sign a release of information to be able to speak with the um, gynecologist. All right, then we have male hypoactive sexual disorder, dis di desire disorder. The screening question here is, do you feel that your sexual desire is less than it should be? Um, so this is persistently or recurrently deficient or absent sexual erotic thoughts or fantasies and desire for sexual activity. Again, the judgment for deficiency can be made by the clinician considering factors that affect sexual functioning like age, um, in general and sociocultural context of the individual's life, that this should be occurring for at least six months. Um, and hi male hypoactive sexual disorder is sometimes associated with erectile and or ejaculatory concerns, which makes sense 
and a man's feelings about himself, his perceptions of his partner's sexual desire toward him, feelings of being emotionally connected and contextual variables may all negatively as well as positively affect desire. So please assess for these. Okay. So the last one that we'll be covering with sexual dysfunctions is premature or early ejaculation. The screening question here is, do you often ejaculate just after starting sexual activity? So a persistent or recurrent pattern of ejaculation occurring during partnered sexual activity with approximately one minute within approximately one minute following vaginal penetration and before the individual wishes for it to happen. So although the diagnosis of premature ejaculation may be applied to individuals engaged in non-vaginal sexual activities, specific duration criteria have not been established for these activities. So, so they're not, you're not able to be given a benchmark for like manual stimulation, oral stimulation, um, anal penetration, just different activities um, involving ejaculation. Um, and then the symptoms uh, in criterion A need to be there for at least six months. So um, with an intervention that we use in couples counseling, uh, with premature ejaculation is sensate focus, where this is like a staged um, intervention where you are essentially reorienting the couple to some sensual touch as opposed to sexual touch. You're taking um, sex off the table, put penetrative sex off the table. Again, remember that, you know, the when we talk about sex, we may all have different definitions. So when you are asking your couple or your relationship, your system about any sort of sexual activity, make sure that you are all on the same page of like, what does sex look like? What, what are the activities that are being engaged in? Um, Cause vaginal penetration or anal penetration are not always the definition of sex for individuals. Um, but if you guys are interested, you can check out um, Sensate focused um, interventions. So again, it's a, like some examples here would be the couple lying together, fully clothed in the light in their bed. And then the next week, it could be lying together, fully clothed in the bed with the lights off. And then lying together naked, not touching one another with the lights off or and then with the lights on. Um, then uh, being fully nude with one another and um, rubbing or touching non-erogenous zones. Then the next week it could be all together um, nude, touching erogenous zones where essentially the partners take turns um, receiving and giving the stimulation. Then it would be um, you know manual stimulation the next week, it could be oral stimulation the next week. Um, and then it could be uh, what is called containing, where if it's a heterosexual couple um, and uh, individuals with a penis and a vagina, um, that the individual with the penis would put it in his partner or their partner's vagina and just hold it, like put it in there, not moving. Um, then you could do that the next week with um, movement. And then the next could be sex to, or penetration not to orgasm. And then the last could be penetration to orgasm. Um, so that's a really kind of like, not all those st steps are needed. Um, some people may spend quite a bit of time in one of those stages uh, longer than a week, but it, you tend to do kind of each activity for th a minimum of three times in a week um, over the course of therapy. Okay, so let's talk about gender dysphoria. I'm going to be very honest here. Um, I am of the camp that this is not a disorder in any way. Um, at the same time, we lived in a we live in a system and function in a system that may the client patient may need a diagnosis to access the hormonal treatment, uh, the surgeries that this individual wants and needs. Um, so this is to me almost like a necessary evil in some ways. And so, you know, please feel free to make some comments on, you know, potential biases that I have here. Um, but I wanted to start us off with some terminology. Um, so, uh, the first that's not listed here is, um, some people say the word transgendered 
and that is in, inappropriate and inaccurate. So if you are going to say that, drop off the ED. Um, so it is transgender or trans. Um, okay, so here, gender and sex. Gender, social construct, sex, biological makeup. So these two things are not interchangeable. We do that, but they are two completely different constructs or uh, one is a construct. Yeah, they're constructs. And then this also sex can also get confusing because it's also what we use to talk about activity. Um, so the other thing is um, recognizing the difference between and the use of transgender and transsexual. Um, so the differentiating factor historically between these two were, was the difference of having a uh, gender affirming surgery. Um, so I know that within the trans community that there, there's talk about top and bottom surgery. Um, so transsexual is when the individual, so again, historically uh, was when the individual had undergone both top and bottom surgery. Um, but this is a bit of an obsolete uh, term here um, where all individuals either just go by transgender or just trans. Some individuals who uh, have historically identified as transsexuals still want to be identified as transsexual to like essentially let people know um, and potentially like mitigate questions around genitals or um, you know, let pe just let people know what their status is. Um, so just any time with, with any of these terms that I'm telling you about, you always want to use whatever terminology your client wants. Um, so largely again, this is obsolete, but some clients, some people, uh, really want to be addressed in this way. So do it. Okay. So sex reassignment surgery is, has, has previously been what was the term that was used when an individual had any sort of surgery in, um, uh, like medical procedures. Um, the term now is gender affirming surgery. Um, so I just encourage you to, um, utilize this terminology. So we do this in many of our classes where we share our pronouns. Uh, sometimes people say preferred pronouns, and I really encourage you to drop the preferred because uh, it's just someone's pronouns. Like it's not what I would like to be called, it's what you need to call me. Um, so now we just use pronouns. We don't say preferred pronouns. Um, so before I get to the nuances of born in the wrong body, because uh, I have a slide on that in the next one is, um, being more inclusive in our uh, gender language. So when you say opposite gender or opposite sex, like they're in a relationship with, or they're attracted to, that is very binary language and leaves no room for anything that's not in the binary. Um, so I'm going to encourage you, again, this is this will take practice. You're gonna mess up. You're going to forget um, that kind of stuff, but to talk about other genders or sex, um, you know, they're attracted to other genders, um, things like that. Uh, so I just encourage you to not really use language uh, referring to or alluding to the binary. So as you saw in your readings, one of the screening questions or the screening question for gender dysphoria as written by Dr. Francis is, do you feel like you were born in the wrong body? And what I will say is that there are very differing reactions to this sentiment, to this question. Um, there are individuals within the trans community who really don't appreciate the, the alluding to the fact that like everything about the current body that they occupy is wrong. Um, and others that really resonate with this question. Um, so I just encourage you to talk to your clients, talk to your patients about the language that they resonate with. So I wanted to share with you a couple of quotes from trans individuals regarding this. So the whole born in the wrong body narrative is usually an oversimplistic way to help cis people, so cisgender individuals, uh, 
understand trans people. It's more like a thought experiment. There are some trans people who definitely feel that way, that they should have been born in a different body. Cis people tend to be hung up on bodies and the idea that how one's body looks at birth determines one's gender. If someone tells them that trans people feel that they should have been born differently, it's helpful for them to understand how deeply trans people's genders should be respected. However, this narrative is very cis-centric. It tends to hold up cis bodies as the standard that trans people wish that they were cis. I can't speak for all trans people, but I don't wish I was cis. I also don't wish I was born in a different body. Mainly, I wish I was born surrounded by people who accepted my gender and then said, hey, guess what? And what, or accepted my gender when I said, hey, guess what? I think I might be a dude. Needing hormones and surgeries doesn't mean that trans people wished they are cis. It means that their bodies, their own body, not a different one, needs to be somewhat different in order to, for them to feel at ease. People note that trans people also sometimes are partially motivated to have surgeries and or hormones in order to feel safe from violence from cis people. Another person says, as other persons have, as other people have said, calling it transphobic is overstating it, but it misses the mark. Let's say you were born with a cleft palate or you have a condition that gives you a hormonal imbalance or your body grows breasts so large that you have serious back problems and need a breast reduction. Maybe you even have all three of these conditions. Would you say that you are born in the wrong body or would you just say that it needs medical attention for you to be okay? Being transgender is kind of like that. There's getting assigned the wrong gender, which is a thing we can fix without medical intervention. And there are problems with our bodies that we need to address through medical intervention with hormone therapy or often surgery, but they're still our bodies. We are born in them and calling them the wrong ones is just a bad way of understanding it. I definitely have some issues with my body. So do most people, but it's still mine and it's inherently me. So nope, it's not the wrong one. So just something to think about when you ask that. Um, so I really, I really relate to this, how cis centric it is. It makes sense to me how cis centric that is of, you know, trying to under have somebody who doesn't have that lived experience, understand it, but potentially it can be, you know, internalized as very pejorative. So gender dysphoria in children, um, as they are differentiated within the DSM. So again, um, don't love this diagnosis, but living in a managed care world and living in a world where insurance needs, justification for dishing out money for things that are very helpful for people. Here we go. Um, so a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and assigned gender, um, or at least six for at least six months or of at least six months duration as manifested by at least six of these following criteria. So we can, um, you can read through these. Another thing to note is that in the gender dysphoria diagnosis in the DSM-5 text revised that recently, very recently within the last couple of weeks was released, um, there's some language changes within the gender dysphoria diagnosis. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, and then the other piece here with children is that the condition is associated with clinically significant distress or impairment in social school or other important areas of functioning. So gender dysphoria in adults and adolescents, a marked incongruence between one's expressed or experienced gender and assigned gender of at least six months duration as manifested by at least two of these um, criteria and that it is accompanied with clinical, clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. 